So good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Dunley, and I'm co-chair of the Equal Action Committee of the Green Party of the United States. Uh, tonight's event is meant to provide us with an update as to what is going on with COP28, which is taking place in the United uh, Arab Emirates. Um, they're in the closing hours uh, of, of the event, not looking particularly good for those of us concerned about uh, preventing climate collapse. But we have two speakers um, who will focus on it. Uh, we start on first with uh, Professor David Bond of Benetton College, who actually attended the first part uh, of COP28. He's the Associate Director of the Center for the Advancement of Public Action at, uh, at Benetton College. And David works with the communities besieged by the fossil fuel industry to develop a more transformative grasp of environmental justice for people, politics, and, and critical theory. Um, it's a night of the Davids. Uh, the second David is David Schwartzman, uh, who's Professor Emeritus at Howard University, a biogeochemist and an environmental scientist. He's an active member of the DC Statehood Green Party, in fact, a recent candidate, I believe, for the city council there, and uh, is also quite active with the Global Greens COP28 uh, working group. And along with his son, uh, Peter, who's uh, actually a Green Party elected mayor out there in Indiana, uh, he's co-author of uh, Earth is Not for Sale. Uh, Ethan will give about a 12-minute presentation or so. After they both speak, we will um, move to, to question and answers. Um, one of the things I point out with um, global warming, Rapidly accelerated, extreme weather becoming more prevalent. Uh, last year, many referred to COP27 as the last chance COP. I've been referring to this year as the river cutting ceremony for the grand opening of the uh, gates of hell, which is what the uh, General Secretary General of the United Nation uh, says that the lack of climate action by the world government has done. Uh, among the key issues at, at COP28, Eight was whether or not they'll agree to a phase out of fossil fuels. Uh, the United States and other fossil fuel producers have been pushing to focus on reducing emission because that would allow them to allow for the continued use of fossil fuels through carbon capture. And the United States particularly is making a massive push uh, for, for carbon capture technology. Uh, the other major issue has been what level of funding the industrial polluters will provide to the global south and other parts of the developing world. Um, before COP started, the Green Party of the United States called upon the Biden administration to support a rapid phase out of fossil fuels and a 10-year transition to 100% renewable energy with zero greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this has been a record number of fossil fuel lobbyists uh, at COP28. In fact, they're uh, chairing it. Um, Many advocates, unfortunately, have given up hope that the cops will pay any real meaningful role in preventing climate collapse, instead trying to prevent them from making things worse um, and relying upon outside agitation. Uh, Peter Kalmas, uh, a climate scientist who spoke at the recent Green Party national meeting, described the COP summit as a sick joke. Um, a couple of the smaller countries have said to sign in the draft text would amount to sign in a death warrant for their country. And then Carolyn Lucas, who's a Green Party member of the uh, Parliament in the United Kingdom, and was also one of the initial authors of the Green New Bill, Green New Deal, back in 2008, uh, stated that Graph COP28 text is absolutely woeful. Tackling the climate emergency isn't something we could do. It absolutely has to happen. And she called upon her government to condemn this text and the strongest possible terms. So this point, I'm going to um, turn it over to uh, Professor David Bond. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thanks for that uh, lovely introduction uh, and also framing uh, of the tremendous pessimism that's settling in um, looking at, at what's going on uh, with COP. Uh, so my name is David Bond. Uh, I teach at Bennington College, uh, and I just spent the past week out in Dubai attending uh, the first week uh, of COP28. Um, I will share my screen so I can do a little presentation. So 
uh my my impressions uh coming out of the week uh, uh being in dubai uh cop 28 part climate trade show part corporate social mixer part uae branding campaign part diplomatic cover for talking big about doing nothing cop 28 uh struck me as playing a game of inches when the hail mary that is revolutionary decarbonization is the only reasonable path left for justice, dignity, and survival. Uh, I, I was struck uh, while uh, in Dubai uh, and re reminded by a C. Wright Mills quote that I, I love that uh, C. Wright Mills said, the immediate cause of World War III is the preparation for it at the height of the Cold War. Coming out of the dystopia of Dubai, I'm left thinking that the immediate cause of the climate catastrophe may now be the official planning for it. Uh, so much of the talk uh, is coming to stand in for any actual consequential actions towards addressing uh, the crisis at hand. Uh, so I thought I would go over very quickly uh, some of the basics of, of COP uh, and, then, and then jump into my own impressions and then a few takeaways. Um, as folks already know, I'm sure I'm talking, <laughs> preaching to the choir here. Uh, the COP process uh, is part of the United uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, the COP is the Conference of Parties. Uh, so there's been some, some moments of real hope uh, for things to move forward in a more consequential way in Rio, Kyoto, and Paris. Um, but it seems like those may have been high watermarks. Uh, and now with COP28, it, we're seeing a, a real shift uh, away from promises uh, of, of transformation uh, and towards a much more uh, kind of pessimistic, uh, sober look at the takeover of the process. Um, coming into COP28, uh, COP28 is the largest COP ever, most expensive to host. Uh, there's supposed to be a record-breaking uh, attendance estimated by some at over 100,000 people. Uh, in Dubai for the COP uh, process. The process. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of hype uh, around this COP, around uh, the, the, the phrase, the phase out of fossil fuels as being included. Uh, as folks know, uh, even talking about fossil fuels uh, in the COP process uh, is a rather new uh, thing. Uh, and there was some hope of this, this COP of being able to include the phrase phase out of fossil fuels prominently uh, in some of the text. Uh, there was also a lot of hope for the, the just transition. Uh, the just transition is an idea that originates in the labor movement. I'm sure folks are familiar with it, um, that, that uh, in, the, in the moving away from fossil fuels, we need to invest heavily uh, in justice for workers and other marginal groups. Um, and that, that moving away from fossil fuels is actually an opportunity to radically rethink our economy. Uh, and there was also a lot of hope and hype around the loss and damage fund. Uh, in fact, the opening plenary uh, at COP28 uh, established formally the loss and damage fund. Uh, and there was some hope uh, around, around these three things. Uh, I was also struck uh, by how strong, sober, and sustained the activist presence was uh, across all of the platforms and venues at COP28. Uh, uh, also, the Small Islands uh, Coalition uh, was was very powerful in voicing what they have been voicing uh, for a number of years now, the e e immediate urgency of doing something. Uh, yet, <laughs> if COP28 was also was happening under the banner of some hype and hope, it also uh, unfolded under tremendous hypocrisy. Uh, as Mark already mentioned, uh, the UAE is the host. Uh, and the president of the process is the CEO uh, of the oil and gas company uh, of the Emirates. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure everyone's seen the news. It came out all of the ways that the process was already corrupted uh, by that position uh, even before it got started. Um, there were more fossil fuel lobbyists uh, at this COP than ever before. Uh, in fact, uh, so many fossil fuel uh, lobbyists that the number of, of them actually um, was larger than some of the, the countries, the delegates from countries, that they had a stronger, a bigger presence than a lot of uh, the countries. Uh, OPEC, for the first time, had its own pavilion, 
uh, at COP. I, I stopped by uh, and they said they were only there for humanitarian reasons, uh, but they had their own pavilion um, at this COP, first time. Uh, and disappointing, uh, I think folks saw the news that Lula aligned Brazil with OPEC uh, right before the start uh, of this COP. Uh, industrial agriculture was also uh, there in force. Um, I went to one of the, the lectures at the UAE Pavilion, the host countries pavilion, uh, and somebody from the Bezos Fund uh, was uh, was talking. Uh, this is the direct quote from the, the head of the Bezos Fund. I just spoke with Jeff. He really wishes he could be here, sends his greetings. I was just on the boat with Bill and Melinda. They also are really interested in what we're doing here today. What were they doing that, that day? Uh, announcing a new wave of investments and innovations, uh, technology to strengthen food systems in the global south. What did they mean by that? Investing massive amounts of money to uh, build up new for-profit industrial food systems across the global south. Uh, I took it as a Green Revolution 2.0, uh, and the specific investment they were celebrating that day uh, was genetically modifying cows uh, to fart less. Uh, and and taking that as a, a, a climate solution. Uh, and of course, the, the cow would be a proprietary uh, commodity uh, for for them. Um, all to say industrial agriculture was there uh, and their presence was well was felt across. Uh, the three big uh, things that folks were hoping to accomplish, the phase out of fossil fuels, the just transition, the loss and damage fund, all all deep disappointments. Uh, the phase out of fossil fuels, as folks probably have heard, uh, it seems like Saudi Arabia is now uh, stalling on all negotiations uh, that are trying to include that phrase, uh, and the COP process is set up, so it has to be a consensus to move forward with text. Uh, and it seems like right now uh, that phrase will not be included uh, in, in the final documents. Uh, the just transition, uh, the, the negotiations I sat in on, uh, there was a big push to make it entirely advisory, no prescription, no punitive measures, no uniform measure of either justice or transition. Uh, and that was a push that was led uh, by the Global South, uh, G77 plus China, um, uh, and, 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 and held uh, fairly hard. Uh, the loss and damage fund, I'm sure folks saw the headlines. Uh, Germany and UAE both donated $100 million to establish. Uh, David, great. about two minutes. Great. Uh, but let's be suspicious about that. Uh, Germany, a developed country, and UAE, uh, technically a developing country. Uh, the two of them were together for a reason, uh, because it's not the responsibility of the global north. It's everybody's responsibility to chip in. Uh, all of the money that went in uh, was a charitable donation one time only. Uh, the U.S. scrounged through the couch and found a chunk change of about $17 million for that fund. Uh, the total amassed right now is at 700 million pledged or there. Uh, and we know, and that's all one time donations. And we know uh, the cost uh, is, uh, is estimated to be 400 billion annually going forward uh, for damages uh, caused by climate change. Uh, there's no permanent funding mechanism, for instance, a global tax on CO2 emissions. Uh, and it's also set up to be run by the World Bank, uh, which is now run by the former CEO of MasterCard. I was on. A, I went to a panel. He was speaking at uh, the the head of the World Bank, uh, and he was celebrating a new innovation at the World Bank: uh, new loans uh, for climate disasters, for rebuilding after climate disasters. So a new regime of indebtedness for the global South uh, is being hawked as a new solution to the climate uh, crisis. Um, I, I can just jump through some uh, things. The most exciting thing. Uh, about uh, COP was everyone is there. I mean, every country, every indigenous group, every member of civil society, every industry, every lobbyist, every banker, every CEO of a fossil fuel company, uh, they're all there. Uh, the, the, uh, the, conve the COP was held at the Expo 2020, a convention center out in the middle of the desert. Uh, there's a 12 lane highway, six lanes on both sides that goes to it. Uh, the only destination of this highway is Expo 2020 that was hosting the convention uh, COP. I mean, it's, it's kind of an absurd uh, city-sized convention center that serves no earthly purpose. Um, they also had a big uh, panel on sustainable policing from the Emirates. 
uh, using the word sustainable in every imaginable uh, way. Um, some of the phrases uh, tossed around, we need more energy, let's keep 1.5 within reach, actionists uh, uh, upon board, uh, and lots of little uh, banners and things about the need for rapid decarbonization, while all the negotiations were actually dead set against that. Uh, there was also this in, inside the convention center, a sign uh, pointing to surreal, which I thought was appropriate. Um, uh, as I said, everybody was there, uh, and that was uh, it was it was actually really interesting to see folks uh, talking. And I was I was struck by the level of actual uh, fighting that was happening on some of the negotiating floors. Uh, indigenous groups were present, and and really one of the few groups that consistently voice the urgency of the situation uh, along with the coalition of, uh, of small islands. Uh, Palestine was there uh, and had some great things to say. Um, this we snuck in for a moment to the VIP lounge, sort of like the penthouse on top of the Titanic, uh, where all of the heads of state hung out um, with the whole sort of servant class running around, uh, bringing them everything they might want. Um, this is the panel where they were talking about the genetically modified cows uh, and folks from the Bezos Fund uh, and others um, talking about. Uh, I was also struck by just how many lobbyists I ran into. Uh, a great number of them uh, had academic credentials. Uh, but when you ask what they did, uh, they all talked about how they represented various industries as lobbyists. Wall Street was one, oil companies another, uh, and industrial food uh, corporations. Uh, I ran into one uh, guy who, as I, he was the lobbyist for Wall Street, and as I started quizzing him on what on earth Wall Street, um, what a lobbyist representing Wall Street was doing at a climate negotiation, he abruptly stopped the conversation by telling me he was late for a meeting with Kamala and he really had to run. <laughs> so that's kind of the absurdity. Uh, if you're looking for U.S. leadership, uh, uh, a cop can't find it. Um, this is the U.S. pavilion that was closed for the first few days with an armed guard standing outside. Um, I thought it was a good visual. Um, uh, I talked to a number of folks from, I'm almost done, Mark, I know I'm over uh, at the uh, Climate Action Network, uh, which as many of you may know, many other leftist groups have sort of left the COP process uh, and washed their hands of it. The Climate Action Network has stayed involved uh, and tries to push it as, as best they can in a more progressive direction. Uh, when I asked them, uh, I was there when somebody was asking them, are you optimistic? The direct quote, no, but we can never surrender these spaces. No more substantial victories will come out of COP, but we can remain here and fight every inch and, and slow down the hijacking of the process. Uh, so a fairly pessimistic uh, takeaway uh, from some of the folks with the Climate Action Network. Um, and I'll, I'll just leave with this uh, mail work, my book, recent book. Uh, but I think it's important to, as we're talking about COP, uh, to remember that since the COP process started, more fossil fuels have been combusted and emitted into the Earth's planetary system since the COP process started than in all previous human history. We've, we've burned more fossil fuels while COP process was going than we burned before the entire human history before COP. Uh, the greater measure of the climate catastrophe has come after the world's nations started gathering annually to do something about it. Uh, which brings me back to that quote from C. Wright Mills at the very beginning. Uh, the, if, if C. Wright Mills says the immediate cause of World War III was the preparation for it. In the dystopia of Dubai, COP28 is convincing proof that the most immediate cause of the climate catastrophe may now be the official planning for it. Well, thank you very much, uh, David. <laughs> David Bond. Uh, our next speaker is gonna be, uh, uh, for some reason they want me to spotlight. Um, Mr. Schwarzman, you may have to unmute yourself in order for me to spotlight you. I did. I admit it. Oh, uh, now we can do it. Okay. Um, so, as I said, David is a professor emeritus at uh, Howard University, and um, 
he was part of the Global Greens Working Group, and it was actually a pretty a sizable Global Greens Working Group contingent uh, at uh, COP28. And I'm going to put on my PowerPoint. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you. And uh, you're going to blow it up a bit. I am going to try. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much. Uh, the preceding David, a very uh, great talk. And uh, I want to emphasize, I will share this PowerPoint as a PDF to anyone interested, because I'm, I do regard my PowerPoints as resources, and it has more information than I can present. Uh, so I'll put my email in the chat as well. It's dschwartzman at gmail.com. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, there it is. And this, this is something I got from Facebook, uh, which illustrates a sedimentary uh, cross-section with expectations for COP28 on the bottom, below gas and oil. I thought it was appropriate. And David Bond just, of course, uh, uh, covered the heavy weight of the fossil fuel lobby. Next slide. This is me a hard time. There we go. So today's news, we already heard. There's a draft agreement and uh, the expected words about phase out of fossil fuels was not there and uh very vague language so we'll see what they come up with tomorrow uh next slide okay so the latest assessment from climate scientists is that the remaining carbon budget that is the remaining uh fossil fuel that could be burned for a 50% chance of keeping warming at no more than one and a half degrees centigrade is uh, about 250 gigatons, as billion tons of carbon dioxide as of the beginning of this year. And that's equal to already six years of the current uh, CO2 emissions. So the conclusion is global carbon emissions must peak very soon and then rapidly decline if humanity has any chance of avoiding a climate hell much worse than we now witness. Next slide. So this is the International Energy Assessment of the Evolving Pledges of COP28, and the red uh, bar indicates uh, that uh, this is the amount of... Uh, CO the greenhouse gas emissions that uh, in basically CO2 equivalent that uh, needs to be reduced, but uh, pathetically is not in the plan, in the pledges as we see. Next slide. So uh, the uh, global green statements was quite good and uh provide i can provide a link to that we deplore the involvement of fossil fuel industries and endorse the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty uh, to accelerate a uh, shift from fossil fuels to clean energy and affordable energy for all so we now witness renewable energy investment has hit record-breaking levels in the first half of uh, 2023. But at the same time, the fossil fuel industry is making a huge investments, continuing to make huge investments, uh, on uh, which will basically make the meeting of the one and a half degree warming target much more difficult. Um, and I have the links to uh, back this up, which uh, you I would happy to share. Next slide. So the demands of the march that I know Mark and I were at, at in Manhattan on September 17th called on President Biden to stop any new fossil fuel projects and repeal uh, you know, permits and phase out fossil fuel drilling on public land. So this is really... Uh, um, a uh, sympathetic or uh, consistent with a global 
agenda to shut down all new fossil fuel extraction projects and shut down all financing by global banks, including the World Bank and IMF. So this will uh, likely and already entailing direct action and building the capacity of a global working class and its allies, especially indigenous communities for just transition and what many look towards a global Green New Deal, not just one in the U.S. and not the problematic one we have now, but a real uh, Green New Deal that's informed more by eco-socialist vision. Next slide. So here is a uh, <laughs> here's a, a symbol of the uh, the obstacle standing in front of us to make this impossible, and that uh, we have to overcome militarized fossil capital. Next slide. Uh, here's a, a photo of a recent demonstration in the UK. You can see the symbol for the Extinction Rebellion and Stop the War Coalition. And linking up stopping war and to the climate challenge. Next slide. A uh, very important editorial from the leading, uh, the leading journal, uh, Science, uh, just April 1st, uh, 2022, which emphasized that we have to stop the uh, endless wars that are going on to have any chance of solving the climate problem and uh, not solving it, but at least preventing much worse uh, consequences than we now witness. And it also stressed that the two leading um, emitters in the world, the U.S. and China, of course, even more, but U.S. historically much more mission than China, uh, We that these two countries have to cooperate. Next slide. Yeah, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. So a call from Palestine to the global climate justice movement is to link up the uh, the struggle. And that's, uh, I'll skip over the next slide. Uh, this was actually a demonstration at COP28. Uh, ceasefire for the uh, ongoing Israeli genocidal war against uh, Palestine, people of Palestine, particularly Gaza. Next slide. Uh, you went back. <laughs> One more. Next slide. We going the wrong way? Yeah, go forward. Uh, you're going all the way back now. <laughs> I. Okay, I'm sorry. There we go. So meeting the one half degree C warming target is still possible. And the prime, I would argue that, uh, long argue, the primary obstacle is the military industrial fossil fuel complex and the wars that it promotes. And there's a good statement in the Global Greens that captures this um, concern. And I wrote an article in 2011 called The Path to Climate Security Passes Through Gaza. I never imagined it would be as relevant as it is now. And I have a new introduction. I gave the link if you'd like to read it. Next slide. So uh, a recent uh, article in the Transnational Institute uh, emphasizes why the military impact on climate change can no longer be ignored at COP28, and probably will be. But uh, Lisa makes this, uh, uh, emphasizes this connection, not only huge emissions, uh, but most of all, it prevents the cooperation that's needed to address the challenge. Next slide. Uh, Sultan al Jabur. Uh, proposed a example, good example of a false solution uh, using uh, blue ammonia, and uh, it's been shown that the uh, this uh, technology would produce three times more damaging greenhouse gas than regular fuels because of methane leakage from the atmosphere and in technology. Next slide. 
Almost done. So uh, you go back. <laughs> you went back again. Okay. Uh, now, uh, this was a letter. I'm not going to go into it. I don't have time. Uh, but uh, we need to transform public finance. This was a letter to the leaders of COP28. And very interesting points. And I'll share it with anyone interested next time. So uh, my son and I, Peter Schwartzman, by the way, who teaches at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, not Indiana, correcting Mark, uh, a typo, a verbal typo. Uh, we did a model of a 20-year transition to 100% renewable energy, which would eliminate energy poverty in the world and have the capacity for climate adaptation and mitigation. So we phase out coal and natural gas, which could methane in the first 10 years, and then use the minimum amount of conventional oil as an energy source to replace all fossil fuels with wind solar power. And we showed it's possible to keep uh, within the one and a half degree warming target if it started very soon. And uh, it's important to... Uh, um, Take note that oil producing countries in the Middle East and Latin America will have a role to play in a world of cooperation to make this transition possible. Of course, this will require some real um, critical political changes in many of these countries, um, uh, but at least potentially they could uh, be a partner in this transition. Next, next to last slide. Um, uh, Mark already, uh, both of you, uh, reach, uh, refer to carbon capture and storage. And here's an interesting um, uh, critical analysis of this and how it's uh, a uh, greenwashing technology. But the global stock take call for rapid decarbonization without carbon capture and storage. And that is capturing CO2 from industries and power plants burning fossil fuel. On the other hand, negative emission technologies, especially direct air capture with permanent storage of crust, will be very likely imperative to bring the CO2 level down below 350, coupled with fossil uh, termination of fossil fuel consumption over the next 20 years. And of course, this is also coupled with restoration of natural ecosystems and a, trans a shift from current industrial agriculture to agroecologies. Uh, the next slide, I think, is um, uh, this is recent research I have been doing with my oldest son, Peter, that China could play a very uh, important role as a world leader in cooperation with the U.S., by building concentrated solar power in the Middle East deserts with the energy capacity for direct air capture of carbon dioxide and permanent burial in the crust of Oman, which is right on the um, uh, Arabian Peninsula, uh, right next to uh, seawater, actually. Last slide. Last slide. Last, next one. <laughs> This is our book website, The Earth is Not for Sale. Uh, skip over to the next two very briefly. Next slide. And that's my logo, uh, a radish. Radical and radish have the same root. Be as radical as reality itself. My, la my very last slide is uh, um, references to my, uh, articles and readings that you might um, check into. Thanks so much. Uh, I know I went over a little bit. Okay. Uh, let's get David up here. Let's get me up here. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for two days. Um, there are a lot of points in the uh, chat, but uh, if you have questions, this is the point to um, add those questions. And while we look at these questions, um, maybe briefly, so where do we go from here? How do we solve the climate crisis after what's taking place at COP28?
You're Imagine, posting that question to us, right? That, that, to, to the two Davids, yes. Yeah, David, uh, the other David, please go first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think <clears throat> asking for solutions from COP is not the place, is not the direction to go. Uh, I think if there if there's going to be a, a solution at the scale of the crisis, it's going to have to come from somewhere else. Um, and and there's good places to start thinking along those lines. Uh, I think there's a, a lot of frustration building up around the world um, with, as one of my students said, a lack of an ability to land a blow. <laughs> that, that there's a lot of frustration and not not a sense of where to land that blow. Uh, to topple what's what's wrong uh, with the kind of fossil capitalism that's defining our our world. Um, so my sense coming out of COP is, is not that we should we should seek solutions not through COP. I think that process is beginning uh, to be clear. Uh, I, I'm very sympathetic to some of the activists who who refuse to to surrender the space, who refuse to to retreat just yet. Uh, but it seems clear that that process is not not going in the direction of any adequate solution uh, for humanity. Yeah, I agree. I, I fully agree. And I, I think the first priority humanity uh, has, uh, I'm going to be not too modest in saying that, I think the first priority is to defeat militarized fossil capital and its political instruments in every country in the world. And that will uh, at least open up a path, potential path, to uh, achieve uh, the goal that we're seeking, at least to keep warming below one and a half degrees centigrade or fight for every tenth of a degree warming that might even be above that. You know, uh, so it's a the technology is there to replace fossil fuels. And to supply uh, civilization with everything it needs, and including uh, some use of hydrocarbons for some purposes. We can make hydrocarbons from uh, reacting carbon dioxide from the air with water with a catalyst using solar power. And that would have no uh, net carbon uh, footprint, okay? So I'm not saying that's the main uh, energy source. It would be solar and um, uh, wind and solar, and that could power human society. And so it, it the, it's a political obstacle we face, not a technological, even though the billionaire class tries to pretend that we don't have the technology, <laughs> which is bullshit. <laughs> I, I'm going to follow up in a previous post in the chat, which follows up on a point that Mr. Schwartzman just made. So how do we defeat militarized fossil fuel? How do, how do we defeat it? A better organization and and putting more uh, more emphasis on the role of the global working class. Okay, it's not going to be, uh, uh, let's say, NGOs that are going to do this. It's going to be have to be rooted in real struggles of working people around the world uh, that address their immediate interests and connect it. I'll give you an example. Uh, pollution, air pollution from burning fossil fuels, killing millions of people all over the world. And it's shortening the lives of people. And this is an immediate uh, impact of burning fossil fuels that, uh, uh, for instance, the air in London is very unhealthy to breathe, right? It's very high in uh, the micro particles and so on that are linked to all kinds of diseases, cancer, ca uh, cardiovascular disease, dementia as well. Uh, so we need to connect we need to connect the dots of struggles. That's the bottom line. You know, uh, the struggle for peace, the struggle against war, the struggle for a more healthful environment, and the struggle for climate justice. So that's my short answer. <laughs> okay. Mr. Bond, did you want to add anything? <laughs> I don't know. 
I don't think I have anything to add. Okay. Um, w w one point, which I know Mr. Schwartzman has has, has addressed previously, um, and other twice I've heard it from him, is you know they is a whole issue of degrowth, and particularly the person point posted this talks about the need for degrowth and steady state um, economies uh, in the global south. So, David, how do you feel, David Schwartzman or David Vaughn? What's your perspective on um, degrowth? David Bond, do you want to pitch in first? I've been talking too much. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I don't want to wade into, you know, the doctrinal, uh, you know, trench warfare uh, of <laughs> theoretical left. Uh, I, I've always found Mike Davis far more uh, insightful uh, in my orientation towards some of these questions than Herman Daly uh, or, or some of the other other folks. Um, and I appreciate some of the discussion that's 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 taken shape in the New Left Review uh, on on steady state economics that it doesn't have a theory of profit. It, it takes growth as a, a cultural preference that we can sort of educate ourselves out of yeah. without any means of actually confronting profit uh, as, as the kind of baked in modality uh, of capitalism. Um, that's where I stand on that without wading too deeply into, you know, debates that, that get really fierce really fast. Um, with the global south, I will say, you know, there there is a, one of the things I was struck by at the COP uh, process was the the huge divides between the global north and global south, uh, and, and, and in some ways entirely predictable. Um, but it, it was curious to me that the global north was constantly talking about the just transition uh, and a number of things within the terms of labor rights, gender equity, and protection of indigenous peoples, which are things I think we, we've all sort of said or or would stand with. It was curious to me that the global South almost uniformly stood against that because they said there's, the logic as I understood it, there's no point in talking about justice within the nation state until we center injustice across nation states. And that the focus in the global north on on simply rights within the nation state was missing the history of empire, the history of indebtedness, and the history of unequal climate uh, vulnerability. And unless we were centering relationships between nation states, we were never going to get close to justice. That was a that was a, a a dispute I saw play out in various ways in the negotiations or, or around the phase out of fossil fuels in the negotiations around the just transition and in the negotiations around the loss and damage fund. And there are really two blocks there, the global North and the global South. And right now they're not speaking the same language. I think uh, uh, you made uh, uh, really critical points there. And, and uh, the imperialism, the imperial relations that you refer to have to be confronted. That's why I'm emphasizing the global Green New Deal, which captures these concerns, not a, uh, you know, uh, going back to simply focusing on uh, the Green New Deal in the United States or somewhere else. We, uh, it has to uh, encompass, as, as David, you pointed out, you know, a real uh, alliance with indigenous communities that are affected the most by extractivism, by mining and so on, which is part of the green tr transition that we have to confront in a transition to wind and solar. It is absolutely inescapable. That should be part of the eco-socialist uh, agenda. And I, I published critiques of degrowth. Let me just summarize very quickly. Grow the good and degrow the bad. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of good things that need to grow. You know, like a, a health provision of real decent health care, of uh, green uh, environments, of an unpolluted environments, of, of course, uh, wind and solar energy of, uh, you know, agroecologies, they all need to grow. What the, what the most 
the most important entity that needs to, to degrow, not only degrow, but terminate, is the military industrial fossil fuel complex that's threatening the life of people and uh, the ecosystems around the world as we know it. So uh, this is deconstructing growth, deconstructing what needs to grow and what doesn't, what, what should degrow, I think is critical in our agenda. And uh, let me just make a quick point. Uh, the, one of the critiques I have of the prevailing degrowth thinkers, and many of them have you know, contributed quite a bit in our understanding, is that they're promoting a global decrease in energy supplies to the world. Now, the global north certainly should decrease its wasteful energy consumption. But if, uh, if you look at the details of this, if we degrow global energy supplies with and coupled with supplying wind and solar energy, replacing fossil fuels, we will not have the capacity for ad um, climate adaptation and mitigation, and we will plunge the a, man, most of humanity living in the global south and a state of energy poverty much worse than they experience now. So this is a Eurocentric point of, of vision to degrow global energy. Okay? Uh, so that's just, um, in a nutshell, what some of my critique of degrowth. Uh, okay. yeah. so, so the next question is probably better answered by my wife, who's not here. Run beyond plastic uh, at Benedict College, where David teaches at. But several people ask, how do we keep fossil fuels from being made in pl into planet choking plastics? Um, well, first of all, there's uh, there's a chemical technology to use carbohydrates rather than uh, hydrocarbons. Okay, and uh, of course, there's a lot of research on, uh, you know, uh, polymers. I prefer to use the word polymers that would biodegrade very easily and so on. Uh, and this, this, it's not only plastics. Uh, it's also the transition we envisioned to... Uh, re get rid of fossil fuels and replace it with renewable energy supplies, right now it entails a lot of rare elements that have to be mined and with a lot of negative consequences. For instance, lithium. Okay, lithium batteries. Now, uh, there is now very important research that uh, shows that you can actually do this pretty much the same job with sodium batteries. And sodium is a much more abundant element than lithium. So it would not require the, the negative impacts that we now witness. But we also should recognize that many countries in the global south uh, get revenue from these rare elements, from mining the rare elements. Now, the more corrupt countries, of course, uh, this uh, profit, it goes to the multinational mining companies, as well as a corrupt political elite in the countries, right? But it could alternatively, in a transition away from the rare elements, this revenue could go to the people. And the same applies to uh, uh, oil production in, a, in a, a couple of decade transition on a global scale. Mr. Bond, did you want to add anything? I mean, <laughs> the Beyond Plastics, I think, has made the good argument that, you know, what we're seeing right now uh, is the, the fossil fuel industry is realized that they're going to lose uh, transportation eventually. They'll fight every way, but they're going to lose it. Uh, and what they're going to do is is maintain their, their scale of planet-killing profits by shifting all of their feedstock over to producing plastics. Um, the uh, the fight right now is is to keep that to block that shift. Um, I think that the fact that they're shifting 
from you know they're they're seeing what's happening they're seeing where where the world is headed and they're building these huge uh, plastics plants pennsylvania texas elsewhere these are the fights we should all be focused on and i take that shift not as evidence of the strength of fossil fuels the fossil fuel industry but their real vulnerability in this moment um and that we should all be you know <laughs> listening to Beyond Plastics uh, and seeing this as the actual time when we can see uh, a, a little weak spot uh, on, on that industry and begin to sort of organize in very effective ways to, to prevent uh, that transition. So we have about 10 minutes left. Um, I, I will say we did do a webinar, I don't know, six months ago with Beyond Plastics actually with Alexis Goldsmith, one of the other staff. So in the notes in this meeting, uh, we will include a link to that if people want to yeah. get into more depth about the plastic issues. Um, w one person is uh, raising questions. What do you all have a feeling about biodiesel and biofuels as a solution to the climate? Uh, bad. <laughs> okay. A false solution. Uh, you know, uh, you know, on a local basis, I can understand the attraction, like biogas in some rural areas and so on. But uh, it's it's a false solution. In our book, uh, with my oldest son Peter Schwartzman, we uh, have a whole chapter on these false solutions, including the biofuels. Uh, Example, uh, there may be a couple of exceptions like uh, the re research on using like, um, um, uh, uh, let's say, certain ecosystems that, uh, that are uh, very diverse, like grasslands, and uh, harvesting them and, and they're growing back and using that. But uh, it this kind of uh, this kind of approach is very limited in terms of energy production, and uh, really the emphasis should be on h high efficiency solar and wind, and uh, in particular more wind floating wind turbines in the ocean and uh, photovoltaics on roofs, and we now have you know, revolution in technology where the efficiency is going up uh, and also photovoltaics on floating platforms as well, you know, on fresh water and even the ocean and and uh, concentrated solar power in deserts. And this would actually just take a small fraction of the surface of the earth and the land surface to produce more than enough energy that humanity will need in this century. Okay. Mr. Bond, you anything you want to add? No. Okay. Um, since you mentioned floating solar panels, I'll just mention in my immediate area, the city of Cohoes is putting floating uh, solar panels on, on their reservoir. Um, I, I'm going to go, one question was asked that's now disappeared because so many questions. Uh, but I remember at COP26, there was a real, real focus on carbon tax and, and, and carbon fees. And that sort of seems to disappear. But um, people ask whether the recently implemented carbon import tax that the European Union has done, was that at all a topic at the uh, recent COP meeting? I, I, I didn't hear it come up. Uh, I, there, was a, there was some talk of, uh, you know, carbon tax, all of that. But the particular uh, EU policy was not uh, part of the conversations I was privy to. Okay. Um, get a comment. Floating wind is massively energy consuming with bad biological side effect. Anybody have a response to that one? Can you, can you repeat that? I didn't catch it. Floating wind is massively energy consuming with bad biological side effect. I don't think that's been demonstrated. And we're talking about a very small area of the ocean, actually. And so if you bet, you know, no technology is going to be uh, completely, uh, you know, positive. But we need to we need to look at the balance sheet of the 
uh, the alternative not creating a renewable energy infrastructure. And the, the alternative to that, the alternative is not having the capacity to mitigate or adapt to ongoing climate change, even if we keep warming at no more than one and a half degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. So uh, it, it, you need to look at, I think people ought to look at the balance of what the overall impact will be one versus the other. And I'm not, I'm not arguing that there, uh, the solar transition doesn't have, you know, negative impacts, particularly because it's not socially managed. It's being driven now by green capital, as I mentioned, with extractivist impacts, negative impacts. We need a social management of this process, particularly by people that are directly affected in their community. Okay. David, I see your head nodding. Anything else you wanted to add on that one? I I agree. Uh, <laughs> I will say on the on the COP process, if that we're, we're you know winding down. Yes. Uh, one of one of the more interesting things I saw was a presentation um, from a guy from the UN uh, Rapporteur for the Environment, uh, which was just making the point that. Right now, there's nothing in the the climate uh, convention uh, or the COP process that has any enforcement mechanism to it. Uh, and, and what what he was arguing was that we should all we should we should start thinking about climate crisis as a human rights violation, yeah. uh, and that there might be real openings for groups to start uh, making cases uh, to prosecute uh, some uh, uh, some of the climate disasters. Uh, and some of the the folks, industries uh, that we in countries that we know are responsible uh, as a human rights violation, uh, and I thought that was that was kind of a striking angle that I I hadn't uh, heard before. Okay, so uh, I mean, one thing I put a lot of these questions now do seem to be getting to the broader climate issue, which we've discussed previously. I have a book. You can all go to the Green Education Legal Fund. Dot org, actually, G E L F N Y dot org. Actually, I was teaching a class for David at uh, been in the college climate advocacy uh, or climate change and advocacy, and basically just research a lot of these basic questions. Uh, I don't pretend to say I was any original thinker, but just put it together so people can look at that. And I know that uh, David Schwartzman has written quite a few books on this as well. But since we're running out of our time, if people, since this is about COP28, any final insights from either of the Davids? Or anything you want to promote? That you, you go want? first, get it. <laughs> I mean, nothing. I mean, <clears throat> the takeaway I had coming out of that, of that uh, dystopia, it's the cop has be gone beyond just becoming, you know, a little bit complicit or a little bit corrupt. It's become, you know, one of the, the heaviest feet on the accelerator, pushing us forward uh, into uh, the climate catastrophe. Um, it no longer stands outside of that in any way. Okay. Mr. Schwartzman? Yes, I would just... Uh... I would just emphasize we have immediate political challenges ahead of us and uh, reemphasize that we have to defeat the uh, the uh, militarized fossil capitalist political instruments. In, in the United States, uh, this is Trump and the Republican Party, which are climate denialists. And we also, this is certainly compatible with critiquing the neoliberal imperialist agenda of the Democratic Party leadership as well. So we got to do both. But let's not pretend that it doesn't matter whether Trump or these presumed uh, nominee, Trump or Biden is elected. Because if Trump is elected and the Republicans gain power in the United States, they will gut all environmental and climate legislation, and we will be set back. Humanity will be set back and be uh, reduce the chances of prevent of uh, uh, preventing much worse climate catastrophes than we now witness. So, those are my closing comments. 
Okay. I'm in the Green Party. And well, perhaps we can all agree that a good scenario would be neither Biden nor Trump. Dumpo. Um, <laughs> but we will send out at least Mr. Schwartzman's uh, slideshow. Anything, David, you want to share with us, we will send out as a follow-up and also to all the, the, the pre-registrants. Uh, at, at this point, the presentation is basically over with. We're going to have a small committee meeting of internal Green Party you know, uh, what are we going to do in 2000 and uh, what's that coming up? 24 type of thing with Eco Action Committee. So any of the Eco Action Committee members are welcome to attend. We mainly be talking about what we're going to have a more in-depth discussion at the uh, January 8th meeting. So thank you all very much. We'll probably take two or three minutes to allow people to sign out and stuff like that. Yeah, thank you, David, and nice to meet you. And I'm looking, you mentioned you have a book. I, I'm very interested in getting that. Negative Ecologies, is that the name? Negative Ecologies, Fossil Fuels and the Discovery of the Environment tracks out the history of how environmental science and policy took shape in the U.S., which was largely as a response to the destruction of the world that fossil fuels were enacting. So that our... Our, our environmental science and our environmental policy at the very core are always responding to disasters, not preventing them. And you can kind of track that process out through. So University of California Press, Negative Ecologies, Fossil Fuels, and the Discovery. I got to get it. I'm definitely get it. And I hope you get a paperback of our book, The Earth is Not for Sale. I got it on my computer right now. All right. <laughs> and go to our website. We have a lot more more recent stuff on our website, you know, including papers and so on. So uh, let's continue our uh, 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 discussion. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. <laughs> Thank you so much for a brilliant presentation. I really, uh, really was uh, inspiring.